Right, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our, our, our latest Wednesday webinar. Uh, good to see you all. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm delighted to be able to welcome back Sarah Davis. Sarah is the Senior Policy and Practice Officer at the Chartered Institute of Housing. Uh, before we uh, sort of hand over to Sarah, I'll do a few housekeeping uh, uh, things. Uh, so great to see you all. Thanks for coming. Uh, we are, as usual, we're recording today's session. So um, it, it will after today's event, we'll publish it onto our YouTube uh, onto our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you're viewing this on on playback, uh, thanks for joining there as well. Uh, there'll be the options for as we go through uh, to use the chat function as well. Uh, so uh, for those that can't see it, if yours is the same as mine, then there should be um, along the bottom. You should be able to see chat, and you can you can ask your questions. I'll be uh, monitoring that. And as, as we go through, and um, there'll be um, points uh, as we go through to, to kind of uh, start, ask questions and discuss things. So um, we, um, today's session's a little bit shorter uh, than usual, because I know that Sarah's got a commitment at, at 12 o'clock. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll try and aim uh, to finish to finish it uh, um, on on time, to, to so that you can meet your your other commitments, Sarah. Uh, Thank you. Okay, so um, I think without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Sarah. You should be a co-host and can share your screen. I'll be in the background. If you need me, just give me a shout, and then hopefully we'll we'll um, sort of I'll 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 drop in and out uh, with questions and things as as we're going through. Lovely. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for being here today and for uh, giving me this time to talk to you. Just going to share my screen, which I hope you can see. And just going to put it into slideshow. Right. Thank you. So, um, so thanks ever so much for um, giving us this opportunity to come and talk to you all about the Better Social Housing Review. Um, so I'm in the uh, Chartered Institute of uh, Housing's policy team. And uh, this is a piece of work that was independent from CIH and NHF, but that we set up some time ago. Um, we've uh, talked to um, Taru about the recommendations that have come out of that um, report. And this is now talking about how uh, CIH and NHF are hoping to take forward the recommendations of the review, which we, which we accepted in full. So um, hopefully an opportunity for you to um, give your viewpoints on what you think of it as well. Um, but I'll just uh, get on with talking to you about it. So. Um, so the reason why we did this is that obviously whilst government stats show that social housing actually has um, is generally in better generally in better condition than uh, than the other sectors, particularly the private rented. Nevertheless, over the last couple of years, um, a lot has come out through social media, uh, through ITN. Um, about where it's falling, it's failing in, in in meeting good decency standards, and it was coming up in in to such a degree that it, you know, we we just felt that we needed to look at why, um, you know, why in spite of the the general conditions of social housing, there were problems coming up, and that those problems seemed to be long standing and you know really not being resolved appropriately. So. The NHF and CIH together felt that we needed to look at what the problems were. Why, you know, were they systemic? Were there things that we really needed to address? Um, and so we set up, uh, we asked to set up a, an independent panel to look at the issues, to talk to organizations, tenants, et cetera, and to challenge the sector and give us recommendations of, of how we could improve. So that's the background behind it. So it was very much an independent panel um, and the recommendations came from the panel, um, which CIH and NHF accepted in full. And what we're doing now is, is thinking about, well, how do we respond to those recommendations? Um, how do we make sure we are improving 
um, the the our stock and um, and the our tenants, you know, residents' experience of their homes uh, in terms of condition. So um, basically, the the independent panel spent some time talking to tenants, to organisations, etc., to groups such as. Uh, uh, tarot stop social housing stigma and um, and came up with the independent report what's happened with it is that um, the outcome of that is that we have set up a, a steering group of chief execs of housing associations to ensure that CIH and NHF and the sector are actually taking forward the recommendations um, and quite a lot came up around the experience of people who are from black and minority ethnic groups, but also single people, disabled tenants. Um, so we wanted to have a particular, ensure that we were looking at that as well. So there's also a group that's looking at inequalities that's also feeding into how we take forward the recommendations. So it's got quite a structure behind it, but it is obviously the reporting in, in and of itself was uh, from an independent panel to challenge the sector about, about some of the things that were coming up. So just to give an overview of the recommendations that came from the panel. So um, there was clearly a call to look back, to look at the sector's core purpose and to refocus on, on what that should be and to, to deliver against it. Um, there's been um, a growing recognition that um, we don't necessarily know the nature of the stock um, as much as we should. Um, where organisations are doing stock surveys, they may be, um, often they are kind of like samples throughout when they do it each time, and they don't necessarily use all the same metrics. So we don't have that kind of like overarching sense of the, um, of our stock. And that one of the recommendations was that we should have that, we should have that, um, that overarching perspective on it. And, um, the other another thing that came through, which we would you, you would expect really from talking to tenants and residents, is that repairs and maintenance was a big issue. It's always the touch point for uh, contact between tenants and and landlords, um, and it's always the issue that matters most because it's obviously about you know um, how easily and conveniently you can live in your home, how much you can access repairs, etc. So there was a, a challenge that we should look at and um, develop standards around an, an excellent repairs and maintenance uh, um, procedure and process for the sector. Um, there was a, a challenge that we needed to go back to, as well as focusing on core purpose, we needed to make sure that organisations were accessible to residents and that it was felt that the traditional housing officer role um, had become a bit diminished. Um, staff in that role were feeling a bit overstretched. Um, and so there was a, 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 a recommendation for CIH in particular as the professional body for people working in housing, that we should ensure that that is a clear um, def, you know, role that's valued, that um, is well uh, resourced and qualified, you know, through our, through our training, our qualifications and ongoing uh, development. Um, very much about ensuring that the tenants voice within their landlords organisations um, can have influence at decision making levels, um, that things had to be done with residents um, along the way. Um, and also that um, in terms of the landlord being close, being accessible and accountable, there was a sense of actually it knowing its communities and being present in communities and working with other agencies. And then the seventh recommendation, which isn't on here, was around um, taking a review, taking stock to see how, how much the sector had progressed against this within a year, again, involving staff and uh, tenants alike to, to, to take stock of where we were at. So in a bit in a bit of detail, the core purpose. So the core purpose, I think, you know, of social housing really was, you know, actually what we want to do is provide decent quality homes for those who can't afford um, uh, it on the market. And that we needed to look at um, providing good homes, 
providing high quality services and building successful places where people want to live. And, and so it, in terms of obviously a lot of that, how we do that is at that local level of communities and of areas and, and the homes themselves. But for CIH and uh, NHF, it's about, well, how are we going to track that? How are we going to measure um, that the sector's responding to that really? And how are we gonna encourage them to do it? And as part of that, obviously, is a huge area of the stigma that people um, have increasingly been feeling over, over the last uh, years and decades around um, living in social housing being seen as um, a lesser choice um, and what that means for people living in housing, what, that, what they feel that means for their experience, even in interactions with their landlord and contractors and staff. Uh, and that actually in terms of recognizing our core purpose is recognizing the value of it and the value for people for and with people who live in those communities. So that's a, that's a huge issue around that as well. And part of this also is recognizing the context in which housing organizations operate uh, and the policy framework that government sets out and the challenge back to government around um, ensuring that we can do this well. Um, you, you're recognizing that uh, over over years there's been kind of like the underfunding. So there's also an external facing um, kind of like challenge back to government around making sure we can do this. We have the right framework in which we can do this as well. So mentioned that actually we don't have a cohesive, comprehensive, consistent set of measures that we, we use to, to check our stock. It, it varies by landlord to landlord um, and often using different sort of like um, surveys and, and organizations to do that. So actually thinking about how we, how, we, how we develop a national audit and what that should look like. Um, the repairs and maintenance. Um, obviously said this is a really critical one uh, and and uh, I think increasingly a growing sense that um, funding for this has been kind of like squeezed as rents etc have been squeezed and that this might have been an area that was was missing um, and actually how what what a good service looks like and you know at what point is that decided? I mean, fundamentally, um, the repair service and whether it's good is something to be judged by landlord and tenant between, you know, as it happens for yourselves between you and your landlord. But also, well, what what might good look like and what are some of the common threads? And is there a, a, a you know a role where we can actually say, you know, this this is these are some common threads uh, that matter to tenants across landlords and matter to landlords. Um, so obviously for, for CIH in particular, you know, what, um, what is the route for um, uh, housing officers to become qualified, to become knowledgeable? Um, how do we check the kind of competency and conduct? And how in terms of valuing housing officers, the people who are most engaged with residents on a day to day basis, you know, how do we ensure that they are valued and uh, their skills are valued? Uh, because there's very much been a kind of like turnover around that and, and, and tenants, I think, have reported that they don't seem to have a consistent point of contact and there's a real challenge around that in the sector. And obviously, one of the one of the key the key recommendations was actually making sure that tenants have their voices heard and that they can see that they they do influence the um, the decision making of their landlords. Um, and again, this has been something that people have felt has got a bit um, lost as as resources have got stretched. And actually, we need to refocus on making sure that there are ways that tenants can get feed in their voice and that actually it's heard and, and shapes how landlords make their decision making and you know the role of scrutiny uh, as a critical friend as well the value of that in, in, in ensuring that um, that landlords respond to that. Having a proactive local community presence um, so the the recommendation came about having community hubs or engaging with existing community hubs um, and engaging with some of the working with other other bodies that work within a locality and this is this is obviously quite an interesting and challenging one in some areas landlords will have quite a 
a, a, a density of their properties will even have communal spaces and will be able to really support that in other areas they may have fewer properties and so how how do we how do we develop that kind of sense of closeness and community presence where there, there are different sort of sort of um uh, compositions of who's involved in a neighborhood for example so so there's a real challenge on that in this in this kind of uh, um you know changing circumstances so so what does that look like and then obviously how do we take stock on this you know and again that's something that we 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 hope that many will be taking stock at the local level and that tenants at the local level with their landlords will be seeing a difference as we support the sector to 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 live you know to respond to these challenges um, and and also sort of like how do CIH and NHF you know, help the sector to make sure they're doing that because it's at the local level that that kind of like stock take needs to happen to make sure there's changes happening. The other thing that came up quite, quite significantly is obviously the fact that there are tenants who face particular inequalities uh, in accessing housing, in the services that they they ha receive in housing, um, in being overcrowded, etc. So. For people from black and minority ethnic households, often a lot of single parent households and and households with a disabled person amongst them, um, so there was some challenge on the on on the receiving of the the report that 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 this didn't this came out strongly, but should it have been a separate recommendation? Um, but what um, what CIH and NHF are doing is with having a working group looking particularly around inequalities and race in relation to the Better Social Housing Review, that we will ensure that all of the actions uh, that we do to respond to the recommendations will have this perspective to ensure that we are taking account of the inequalities that, that some residents face and addressing that and being appro appropriately sensitive to that in the, in the actions that are taken up. So, what have we been doing? So um, obviously we recognise that the context in which the Better Social Housing uh, report came out was that we have a housing policy framework which is changing. There are particular regulatory and legislative changes coming up and we need to make sure that the work of in responding to the Better Social Housing uh, report takes account of that and links in with that and builds on that uh, rather than trying to do things separately. And, and there are many touch points and common um, common areas. Um, so we've proposed a an action plan that has gone out to NHF members, our members, where we've discussed with groups such as Tarot and um, Social Stop Social Housing Stigma and TPAS, etc., to get some feedback and to help us um, shape that action plan. So um, what we're doing is we've recognised that there are CIH and NHF will be working together on all of, all of the responses, but some one organisation will be taking the lead on some. So um, we're proposing, obviously, that the NHF is leading on a core purpose because um, this this better social housing review was set up specifically looking at um, housing associations because the NHF were one of the founding uh, members of it with CIH. And so they are looking at housing associations core purpose around delivering those good homes and good services and making places that people want to live. And what does that mean? How, what does that look like? Will be something that they are, they're working with it, with members and, and uh, CIH members about. In terms of the audit, again, that's um, an NHF lead where we're looking at what, what core indicators do we need to have in common so that we have a better comprehensive picture of what social housing um, looks like? You know, what's the quality of our stock overall? Um, with repairs and maintenance, CIH will be leading and developing a task and finish group to look at this because, as I said, at the end of the day, what matters around that repairs and maintenance service is that it, it, it works for you and your landlord. So residents and landlords together to have to, to develop what matters to them. But actually what, what is useful is, is to take that learning and to take the, how, it's been, how it's been developed and the learning from it um, for, to share across the sector. So that's, that's the way we, they're thinking of taking that forward. 
obviously the housing officer role so CIH was doing a lot of work around professionalism um, before the social housing white paper we've been carrying on with it through the social housing white paper and obviously the bill involves some um, some requirements for the sector around mandatory qualifications for senior staff it also gives the regulator powers around um, uh, a competency a conduct standard to set to set a standard uh, so a lot of our work you know is is thinking about that framework but also what we as a professional body what members um what tenants would want to see from a kind of a professional so we've been doing a lot of work around that and and so we will we'll carry on doing that in response also to the to the to the recommendation in terms of tenant voice the NHF and together with tenants, it will be looking at how it grows that, uh, how it learns from the, uh, you know, the initial kind of sign up and how it's, you know, how it builds on on that and reinforces that. In terms of community hubs, CIH will probably take a lead and look at well, what, what's happening and what's good and and how do we, you know, how do we develop that kind of flexibility to be present in communities when there are different kind of like, um, you know, different different uh, other players involved different density of stock etc what what does good look like and how do we promote that in the sector and then the review obviously will be at that local level but our steering group and the working group looking at inequalities will be meeting throughout the year to take stock as well now i'm not sure you may have um, members on this course you know that that actually don't live in housing association properties but live in council properties and in uh, uh, properties managed by Elmos on behalf of councils. We are having ongoing discussion with the LGA, uh, ARCH and um, the NFA, uh, which are being very positive. Um, and so we're just looking at how this, a lot of these principles apply. Um, you know, so we're having that discussion to think about how how the, the recommendations might apply across, across the sector. So those discussions are ongoing. <clears throat> And as I said, we're also bearing in mind where, <coughs> excuse me, the work that we are doing also sits alongside the work that's been initiated by the Charter for Social Housing Red Residents and that's been carried forward in the regulation bill, um, including around professionalism, but also obviously in the bill there will be something on the AWAB's law about responding to um, disrepair, uh, etc. Uh, in, in, in certain timescales. And you'll, you'll hopefully know about the 4 million homes launch, which was the tenant empowerment and opportunities program being led by CCH that's, um, that's just been launched, which is, which is the government's commitment in its social housing white paper to support tenants. Uh, so I should just say our last webinar um, was, was actually um, a, a promotion of the 4 million homes. Great, uh, um, great. Launch. So if anybody, uh kind of navigates to our youtube channel there's a recording um of the of of the that session yeah brilliant brilliant um and just um i i can't darren just to give you a heads up i can't actually see a clock so do tell me when i'm overrunning uh so that we've got time for any questions because i can see there's a lot going on in chat although i can't see what's happening so yeah let well, me know yeah, we, uh, so um, we've we've got about thirty five minutes left, so about about fifteen minutes left on the on the presentation. But if you want sure. to pause part way through, just that that that's fine as well. Okay. Yeah. No, that's brilliant. So just um, just to give you a sense of how we're taking it forward, to 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 think about the kind of like the housing officer role, because as I said, we've already been doing quite a bit of work on this um, on professionalism more broadly. And within that, we will obviously be looking at well, what does what does that work around the the housing officer role? What does what does that role look like now? Um, does it look different in different places? And how do we how do we make sure we encourage investment in um, skilling the housing officers or whatever the equivalent term is um, to make sure that they actually can deliver? And also to address the fact that at, it's it's often at that level that a lot of staff are seeing the re reality of how tenants are struggling around cost of living for example and um, you know are you know trying to cope with mental health issues and it's often at that level that there's a real um connection and therefore obviously for staff um some real challenges in being able to respond as they'd want to and um and being able to support tenants so you know there's a there's a lot of um 
a lot of demands on staff at that level. So, so we're looking at, well, what does it mean to sort of like really uh, respond to this uh, within our professionalism agenda? And also, obviously, we're aware that government will be setting, <coughs> has set some mandatory standards um, for the decision makers, the senior staff, in that, you know, obviously in the hopes that, that as decision makers, that will set the right culture, um, but also that um, it, by not setting a mandatory standard for staff across the piece within organisations to try and avoid that kind of reclassification, I think, of housing associations. I think that's why they've tried to target it there. But nevertheless, the, RA, um, the regulator will have powers to set a competency and conduct standard. And there'll likely be a consultation around how these things are implemented and developed after the bill becomes an act. So it's not going to be a complete, you know, um, immediate, but there will likely be consultations after the bill becomes an act on what this means and how, you know, how we can do that smoothly. So we're looking at, you know, um, ensuring that people uh, who are our members are aware of and sign up to the code of conduct and the code of ethics. Um, how they use our professional standards framework to look at their own professional behaviours, knowledge and skills and identify how they need to um, perhaps address gaps or refine their skills and also how um, CIH in its networks can be a kind of like community of support for housing officers um, uh, at all, you know, and housing staff at all levels. So we are doing a lot of work internally to think about what, what's our package of support for staff at different levels. Um, so there's qualifications, there's ongoing training, there's, uh, you know, what, what do we provide to help them meet the standards that we say you should have as professional uh, housing uh, staff, you know, with our professional standards framework, how do we support them actually to make sure they do that? So this is just some of the things that um, obviously we have in terms of our qualifications and areas that it covers. Um, but it is, it's not just the qualification, you know, it really is around this, the professional standards framework looks very much at um, skills uh, and behaviours as well as knowledge. Knowledge is really important, obviously, they've got to know housing law, they've got to know, you know, um, the ASB law, etc. But it's also how they put that knowledge into practice in, in connection with uh, tenants and residents that's really important as well. Um, and we, you know, how, how we make sure that they can do that, how we equip them to do that. So we're looking at our qualifications, our training, our professional standards, all the things that, that the events and policy briefings, everything that we can do that that we do and how that goes together to support um, staff at all levels, including frontline staff. Um, you know, making sure there's a, a clear code of conduct and, you know, we do have routes to deal with breaches, etc. So um, making sure that, that, you know, members know about that and promoting um, where organisations do work with CIH to really upskill their staff and make sure there are professional standards and showing the benefit that's come from that. So we, we've got internally a, a whole programme of work looking at, um, you know, what are the routes that people have to be qualified, to be trained, to um, develop their skills, um, to take take do a stock take on what they might need to upskill on etc and how how are we making those kind of routes clear for our members so um so where are we now um so in we have obviously the report is out uh, and its recommendations um the draft action plan has been being discussed with members and stakeholders including uh, taro um, what we're doing now, we've gathered in what people have said to us about the um, about the action plan, and we'll be going back and looking at it and looking at you know what might need tweaking or changing in response to that. The final action plan that will be public um, for for everyone would just be out there in in the public domain. It's likely to be published in May. Um, it says mid May. I think it may may eek towards the end of May, but it it will be out in May. And um, so from June onwards, we are actually, uh, and, and the action plan will have milestones and dates to it as well. 
Um, so, for example, the audit will likely take a while, you know, so this first milestone will be actually, you know, developing those indicators that we, we you know, that are common that people can apply uh, before we go on to then we'll actually, you know, the rolling program of applying it. Um, so we will be um, looking at how we monitor actions being taken under every recommendation and also report on the progress that's been made. So the steering group of uh, CEOs will, will continue to, to take stock of what's happening. And so will that working group around um, inequalities um, so that we are actually making sure that we address some of the, some of the you know, embedded in inequalities, structural inequalities that came out clearly in the, in the recommendations and the report. So um, still perhaps a, a, a squeak of time for, for any, and for today for me to take back any comments from people on, on, on their take of, of where we're going with the, um, the recommendations and how we're responding. Um, and, you know, there, there's some contacts and uh, I know that, uh, you, that Darren has the um, slides, so obviously can, can also be circulated. So um, yeah, that's, that's where we're going. It's, it's, and, and we, we do feel also that the action plan will be an evolving process to make sure that we what we want to do as we take it forward is to be taking stock that what we've planned to do in actions is actually is actually or will actually lead to some changes. So we do want this to be to be something that changes things um, alongside all of the changes that are happening in the wider legislative and regulatory framework. So, you know, it's it's a commitment that that this actually should lead to changes for for the for the better um so i'll i'll stop there and stop sharing darren so that we can go into the discussion thanks sarah uh, there, was a, there was a lot to process there wasn't there there was also a, a lot of, of of chat and comments as well for so i i've been trying to keep on top of them but it is it's been it's a bit challenging oh hold on a moment it's a bit challenging to so apologies to anyone if i've not been able to respond i'm going to, i've been trying to make notes as well at the same time so i'll i, I will do my best to kind of cover the various uh, questions that that have been raised uh, and there'll be chances for others to come in as well on on that as well so um firstly um i'm going to go back to the beginning just uh, hopefully this is gives uh, there's a there's a kind of a running order to this as we've been going through. So that I get, if we go right back to the beginning in terms of the panel and the independent the independence of the, that panel, um, are you able to say firstly why why I mean it might be self evident really, but why do you think it was so important to have the, the an independent panel? And secondly, it, how how was that panel selected? Do do you know? <laughs> So, um, so the reason we wanted it independent was um, we wanted the 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 issue was that a lot of the evidence demonstrates that a lot of social housing is actually of good quality, but we were having these repeated um, stories coming out where not only was it not of quality, but the way things were dealt with weren't yes you know, weren't right weren't appropriate. So. What we wanted was someone who was who kind of understood the sector but wasn't part of it to lead on that, so that that so that it wasn't any kind of um, they were coming in, I suppose, just just with a fresh pair of eyes to to identify why that some of that was cropping up, and um, so the the um, the chair had. Uh, was previously uh, involved with shelter so knew the housing sector knew some of the issues and um, was experienced around kind of like uh, uh, undertaking those. Now, I've gone blank on the lady's name, which is appalling, but um, but the, the website is up and running still. And so there, there was information about the independent panel members on that. So I'll send on a link. So I've put a link in the chat already, Sarah. So I've put a link in the to the independent members. I think it was Helen Baker, is it? That yes, you're, it was. That you're yeah. referring so, to. So the reason I went blank, Darren, because I was thinking of Kate, but Kate Baker, and I knew it wasn't Kate Baker. So it's Helen. I was getting confused with with just someone who did a, a a big review of housing need years ago. So thank you. So um so yes, yeah, so she'd been previously in, uh, uh, was involved. I think still is involved in shelter with shelter. So she knows. Uh, but she comes from that perspective of championing 
um, championing sort of like people's housing, housing and housing rights, etc. And she um, was the person who uh, reached out and chose panel members. There were only a few, and and um, the the aim was to try and get coverage um, of tenants' experience. So, for example, the, one of the tenants involved in it was um, a kind of like active tenant with the housing association who was a disabled tenant. So that we had different perspectives coming through. So um, we didn't steer. Um, Sort of who was part of that panel or, or the experience they needed there was um, a secretariat provided by a, a, a legal firm so that even the secretariat really for the panel was independent from us because yeah we just wanted it not to be not to be seen by um tenants and residents that um it had already come with the kind of sector filter um other than people who had experience of living in the sector so um so the that that's that's why it was a small panel so that it could be fleet of foot because really we wanted it to you know to really look at the issues and and to challenge us we were aware that there'd been quite a few of the stories in the press and we just felt we needed to 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 respond um on this just gonna move Mute, mute people because they're getting a lot lot of interference there so apologies to anyone in terms of uh, apologies to anybody in terms of any interference then um so um next next point that i was going to have is there was a question uh, that was raised about um inequalities and this is uh, often sort of raised as we as we go through and this is uh, the kind of the like we're all used to the kind of nine areas of protected characteristics um do, do you think that there was anything that came out of it i know it's not one of the recommendations but um uh, do, do you think there's any benefit in in um as the establishment of a protected characteristic around tenure because the idea that um, I, I guess there's a lot of stuff that came out with stigma and, and that was re replicated and also contained in, in this review as well, wasn't it? The stigma continues to be a really big uh, issue. Um, yes. uh, what, 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 what's your thoughts on, on a kind of a protected characteristic for, for, for um, the regulated housing or sometimes no social housing sector? It's, it's a really interesting one, isn't it? It wasn't something that came out of the independent report or their recommendations, although all the way through their recommendations, they noted that the experience of people from black and minority ethnic groups, the experience of disabled people, often the, dis the experience of single parents was, uh, the outcomes were less good, whether it was in access, whether it was, you know, in terms of the kind of conditions they were living in, et cetera. And that isn't just within regulated social housing, that's, that's generally, in, in, in their in people's experience of housing um, so for us it's really important that we do that that running through our action plan is also that check that we we address issues around inequalities predominantly from those that came out really strongly which was from black and minority ethnic but also uh, disabled residents etc so um that's one thing. The, the challenge about should there be a protected characteristic for um, people living in social housing? That's a really difficult one. But, um, I think that very often you'll find because of the, the lack of supply and the fact that social housing has become um, such a squeezed resource, so it's very much focused around meeting um, needs you know people have to demonstrate a need um for social housing to access it rather than it being tenure of choice as it once used you know could be um it's by definition people generally have additional needs and may fall under some of the existing um uh, protected characteristics so the issue is would there be a benefit for social tenants to have a separate protected characteristic or is it actually we need to make sure we're stringently addressing some of the protected characteristics that exist and making sure we're looking at where inequalities exist already um because it may it it being a protected characteristic may help to focus 
but on the other hand would people feel that it it reinforced um, it hasn't necessarily on other protected characteristics so would it for social housing or is it the fact that it intersects so much with some of existing uh, protected characteristics and discrimination that actually if we tackled that it would be it, it you know it might be dealt with it, it's a difficult one and I, I don't know that I have an answer <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, I, don't know. I think it's just an interesting debate, really. I'm aware that within the equalities legislation that there was the, um, the there were other parts to it. I think it was the first part where it said about economic status and the protection of economic status, which has never been enacted um, by 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 this government, uh, but was obviously included within within the legislation as part, because of the transition in 2010 for the Equalities Act. So I think that there's. There's, there's maybe maybe different ways in which this could be could be addressed, but it's certainly something to consider. It's an idea that we haven't kind of specifically explored, but it was it has come up in the chat, which was worthwhile uh, going through. Um, could I could sorry could could I mean and I could I just come in there, Darren? So could I just come in there? It's Leslie. Oh hi, Leslie. Uh, hi hi. So, I mean, I absolutely agree with you with with regards to the other parts of the Equality Act. It's the socioeconomic duty um, that has not kind of been moved forward, but it's also about um, removing barriers. I know that a lot of organizations have uh, removed barriers to encourage engagement. So there is parts of the Equality Act that are um, enabling inclusion and trying to remove barriers, but it, I don't think it is. I think more more can be done in that area of the Equality Act to enable um, less equal, you know, inequality. Um, with uh, the kind of findings of the report that Sarah was talking to. Yeah, I mean, I think the report makes it clear, doesn't it, that there's more that needs to be done in this area around um, inequalities, and you've got the separate. Uh, uh, panel which is which is looking specifically at that haven't you as as, as we move forward I'm, I'm aware there are loads and loads of questions and queries and we're a little bit shorter on time so i'm just gonna just gonna uh, go through um there was an interesting thing about um in-house repairs versus and, and I suppose this is going to be a segue into culture and professional qualifications, which we're, we're, we'll go in a moment. But on, was there anything that came out that you're aware of? I didn't see in the main report where, where there were differences between in-house repairs teams versus ex, kind of external contracted uh, uh, um, repairs services. And I guess the point there is, is not just about... Um, control of delivery it's that if you your if the the landlord staff there's also the options there around kind of the culture of the organization and the understanding and i guess that's where, I, where we're going with this discussion as well was there anything that came out in the review so there hasn't been anything that came out of the review itself but i i do expect that something like that might come out of the kind of task and finish group looking at this recommendation because one of the one of the thing, ways we're planning to take that forward is to look at what, what best practice looks like around um, repairs and maintenance. And that might look differently for different organisations, but there might it's about honing the principles, isn't it? And I think you're right. I think the issue is that in-house, there is, there is an element of being able to understand and steer the not only the knowledge but the conduct of of um of staff although a lot of organizations particularly where they have partnerships with contractors do a lot of work to try and um have a close partnership that includes uh, understanding the values of the organization and what that means for when contractors go into people's homes so i think I think there are, you know, it, I don't think it's a simple kind of like binary in-house external. I think it's then about, well, how do you work with external contractors and partnerships to, to get them to understand the, you know, that they kind of represent you when they're going into people's homes and that there are certain values and conducts that they need to uh, um, exhibit when they are interacting with tenants and residents. So I think that might be an interesting one that comes out of the action that we do to respond around repairs and maintenance. 
Yeah, okay. So, which is a really nice segue actually into the work that, so we've been doing some work with tenants around developing a respect for all charter, which now published, it's on our website. Uh, what we've said within that is that, um, what we've said that within that is, is that there is, um, that this is not just for, for uh, kind of staff, it should apply to any stakeholders, any contractors, any anybody that, that's involved with delivering services to tenants, because these this is about behaviours and the kinds of behaviours that, that uh, tenants should be able to expect from the landlord. Yeah. They're paying the rent, so they expect certain certain standards uh, from that. So, so that kind of links into, there was lots of um, questions and discussions around professional qualifications or who they're going to apply for. I'll say a, a little bit because I, I, we don't want to go too far off the, the, um, this review. Um, we have got a, a webinar on the 24th of May, which is going to specifically explore and explain some of the, some of the new, what, what we know, what the announcements have been made to date around the requirement for mandatory professional qualifications who that will apply to and who it won't apply to um and and and, and really gauge opinion on on some of that because as you said there's going to need to be some some further uh, um there's going to need to be some further dialogue and there's going to mm. be opportunities for there to be a, uh, a a consultation specifically on that we know that there's going to need to be a government consultation on a direction to the regulator. So this is the government saying what the regulator needs to put in place mm -hmm. on setting up a new uh, competency and conduct standard. So at the moment, we've got a range of both economic standards and, and consumer standards. Those consumer standards are going to be reviewed after the, the new legislation is put in place. But then there's going to be a new additional one around competency and conduct that will include some of the details around mandatory qualifications but it will extend further it will be for all staff as we understand it and that it will be that it will also uh, explain things around behaviors um, as well as just the qualifications obviously qualifications is um, a big um uh, is, is, is kind of almost central and core to what cih is is, is about as the professional body for the body for profession, professional housing people. Um, is, there, is there anything that you wanted to say specifically from the review around that kind of professionalization agenda uh, specifically? And do you think that the, 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 the requirements are going far enough? So um, obviously the review was particularly concerned with um, those staff that are there um for for tenants and the fact that it, it, so that the ones who are there most often so on the on on the front line so to speak um that housing officer role which may be called neighborhood officer uh, you know may have different titles um and a sense that tenants felt that that role was overstretched and therefore you know patches too big and and therefore not able to really provide that connectivity um, so it didn't necessarily look at what government's looking at in terms of it's introducing mandatory qualifications for those in senior roles. Um, but it's, as you say, it's competency and conduct standard, I think will be much more around behaviours and conduct and, um, and will be a broader standard, I think, for, for, for all staff engaging um, in, in an organisation. Um, so... So, so what, what CIH is trying to do around its professionalism is obviously our membership is people at all levels uh, working within housing organisations. And we would, we would, so our professional standards framework does look at knowledge because knowledge is important and you need to have the knowledge to, to do your job well and to provide a good service. So knowledge is important in that respect and qualifications and training support that knowledge plus policy outputs that we do, uh, for example. Um, but it's it's more also about the values that you have and taking stock of how you um, conduct yourself. And, and so that, that standards framework for us is a big part of the professionalism. And we would hope that it would be useful for um, 
for organisations to think about how they might meet the, the standards around competency and conduct. Um, so I think I think that you know it's 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 bigger than it's bigger than a qualification, which is a a, a point in time. Yeah. Even knowledge has to be updated as as things change. Um, I, I, so it, it is that broader, it is that broader, how do you keep yourself up to date? So that's the continuous professional development. And how do you just take stock of what your behaviours and attitudes and conduct is? Because that's also a big part of, of what makes a difference for tenants. So does that kind of answer your, your query, Darren? I'm not sure whether it... Yeah, really yeah, I, th I, th I think it does. So I was going to go on just to say about um, how's definition specifically of housing officer as well, which I think is wrapped up in this. But I can see that Deb's put her hand up and I know that she was the person who'd asked that question in the chat. So I'm going to go, go across the Deb. Was it going to be related to that, Deb? No, it absolutely is. Um, and I was just going to say that an awful lot, excuse me, I've got the light on, an awful lot of those that are on the front line are not technically housing officers, so employment and training, but you can't divorce what someone's telling you and just do the bit that you are tasked yeah. to do. Um, what I was going to say was um, there's actually a huge panic at the moment in the sector and a contraction of the amount of officers actually employed, including a wage stagnation, and we're losing really good people. And in our front line, if you're talking about those that deal with antisocial behaviour and some very tough issues, we've got ex-police officers, ex-social workers, and actually a lot of people have got a great deal more um, experience and expertise and simply housing qualifications. But the one thing that's not been factored in is in within the organisation I work for, they, they did some level twos. The problem was they wasn't giving anyone any time to do this and people just dumped the qualification because they're working at eight, nine, ten 10 o'clock at night to try to get through their caseloads because of the contraction of staff because of the focus on other issues such as retrofit and all the other things that are you know, pushing higher up the agenda. Mm. I think there's a lack of recognition that there are a lot less people at the front line than perhaps yeah. there were. And there's many comments on here about how many people are in our caseloads. Um, and I think that one of the things that's not been done is actually asking the frontline staff what they think of their own organisations, rather like a best company's um, sort of feedback, because I've heard of officers who have done exactly what they've been told to do. They've been given no autonomy whatsoever. And when a complaint has come in, they've been over, basically, it's been... We, well, we can do that now yeah. just to get rid of the complaint. So it's not about professionalism. It's not about the standards. It's about somebody needs to look at the demands on those frontline officers because many people really want to do a good job. Yeah. But that's the other bit. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, well, I, I absolutely agree with you on that one. And um, so what's the, uh, what, 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 the bigger framework in which we all set our action plan, I think, absolutely has to recognise that housing organisations and the staff within them are very stretched because and, and overstretched because we have seen um, increased demands upon organisations and what they're expected to deliver with decreased investment. Um, and also, obviously, um, where you've got just decreased sort of like capital grant for new homes or for renewal programs like retrofit you then have organizations trying to stretch what they what they have through rents and and it's a real it's it there are a lot of different avenues that are are producing a lot of um demands on on organizations and on their staff and i think so while CIH would look at what's the professional route, what's our support for people, it's not about not acknowledging that actually the environment in which they're working is really quite difficult. And we have seen a decrease in staff in, in this, this area because of X, Y, and Z. And that bigger context in which we will be setting the action plan is a, is, is a challenge to say, actually, you know, from 2010 onwards, we've had like 63% reduction in capital grant for example so you know things in that the sector's generated it has had to stretch much further um and and that's you know and rents can only kind of do so much because we're conscious that people are living in a cost of living crisis so that's a big complicated framework in which we have to set this 
And then obviously there is the issue about what does that mean at the organisational level in terms of where it puts its priorities. Um, and that, that's, that's, kind of, that's a difficult one. And, and I'm, I would say to you that I'm not sure exactly where that sits in terms of how we take that forward in the action plan, but that's something I'd, I'd feed back. Thanks, Sarah. I mean, we, we Georgina made a comment in the in the chat about uh, comparisons with Vienna, and essentially what what the say what she was saying was that, and and I think is where a lot of the problems stem from here is we just have simply haven't got sufficient amount of of affordable of truly affordable housing, not what's called affordable housing, yeah. um, and 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 from that that means that that housing is rationed. If you're rationing uh, access, then um, there's all additional barriers to access, which then has the effect of creating additional stigma mm. associated with the, mm. the sector as well. Mm. Uh, and, and, and ultimately, which is there doesn't seem to be the political will. And I think what, what you were just saying there about the succession of reduction in, in, in grant and funding, and actually just the financial model which supports this, which is based on existing tenants supporting and subsidising any new developments, which are largely being financed through private finance mm -hmm. and the leveraging of the balance sheet strength that, that that's there. We could just see that that model just doesn't seem to be working. And we're yeah. seeing the symptoms of this on many of the things which are highlighted in the, in yeah. the social housing yeah. re review. Can, can I just say, unfortunately, I need to go. I, I was going to say, so that was to bring it up to the big, to say a big thank you. I think there's a good place to, 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 to say goodbye and to, to say thank you, Sarah, for coming here. Last comment. Can I, can I say, um, if, if you have things that people really wanted to raise questions, if you're happy to gather them together, Darren, and send them over, then I'm happy to see how we can, you know, can respond to that, you know, in a way that that people do have some questions asked. So just wanted to make that last offer before I said thank you ever so much. Um, we could have done with maybe an extra hour on top to have this great discussion, but we, we really like to know what 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 the questions it's raising for you. So thank you very much indeed. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, well, thank you, Sarah. Really appreciate that. Th thanks for coming along today. So. So, so in, in, in relation to, to that specific point, um, if, if, if anyone on the call today, if, if, they, if they could um, maybe set email through uh, questions uh, to us, say by the end of the week, we'll gather them up, get them across to, to, uh, uh, to Sarah, and then that gives her like a week or so to, to, to respond, and then we'll distribute that to, to all the, the, the attendees, so very happy to do so. Okay, um, there was just a couple of other uh, uh, issues which were which were uh, highlighted, which I wanted to uh, um, bring, make reference to. Uh, there was somebody and there's been so many comments, I, I can't remember who made the specific point, but somebody made quick, uh, reference to about trauma-informed trauma informed training. Uh, and we've, we've been doing a lot of work in this area around emotional insights into um, uh, in behaviours. So uh, if anyone uh, hasn't seen already on our website, on social media platforms, we've got a report out this week, which is about rethinking regulated housing in England. Um, home as an emotional place uh, we've got a launch event on that next next week on the um uh, 4th of may uh, so if you've not booked onto that uh, encourage you to do so it's going to be the first of a series of uh, publications that we'll be making really to try and uh, bring focus onto the behaviors so lots of comments today were around uh, about how people are being treated or, or and the lack of respect that they feel that they're being treated uh, with so what we're trying to to do with it with with that program is is to really focus on the people uh, the, the their experiences and 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 so that's a better understanding of the needs of of individual tenants and that landlords need to um, better understand and cater for those in the delivery of those of those services so that's we we launched our campaign last week and we're going to continue that throughout the throughout the summer so we're really pleased to be to be um running with that um, I think there was an, another quite querying question about accreditation of prior learning, and I think that there is going to be some announcements on 
on on some some of that uh, but we don't know any of the detail and that's what some of the things which we're, we're which we'll be really interested in 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 seeing when once that's that's published as well uh so uh last couple of minutes i hope that you found that that was a a helpful session was there any kind of final uh questions from anybody that they wanted to 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 make could you could you put your hand up can't see anybody's hand coming up um is it is it get get gaius is that is that the gaius uh i think I'm going to ask you to unmute. So is that this? Yep. Is that uh, coming through, Darren? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Um, well, you, you'll have perhaps seen from the chat. Uh, I think I, I think a huge concern is I, I don't feel this review addresses the real behaviour of housing association in, in in relation to tenants. I mean, as I, as you can see. Our experience is of landlords closing down, uh, you know, when you get, come to talk of uh, involving, consulting, uh, respecting tenants, uh, our experience is of landlords closing down independent tenant bodies, closing down their contact with them, and then replacing them with groups of tenants whom they select. And to a degree, really, I'm, I'm the residents concerned are well-intentioned but they often cultivate i mean our own landlord hexagon actually did this saying we're, our independent tenant body was asking the wrong questions and uh, much bigger uh, housing associations than our little one uh, ha have done the same thing to our knowledge you know as i said we, we we're, uh, some of us here are also members of social housing action campaign which is a, a national independent tenants organization and frankly, you know, the National Housing Federation's attitude seems to be to hope they can ignore us and we'll go away. Um, and this this selecting your own tenants to consult, well, as I think we all know, is part of the etiology of the horror of Grenfell. I mean, it gets really serious when you when you exclude the voices you don't like. Uh, and, you know, I'm a bit concerned that this review not quite clear where the independent tenant I, I appreciate it's difficult to review uh, uh organize but you know a little concerned um about the nature of the tenant input into this but but you know you know and i mean the government's own green paper was really quite radical about this and would have given tenants the power to remove board members <laughs> uh ultimately you know as as uh um community interest type shareholding and all that sort of thing they actually discussed that in the in the, in the uh, government's own green paper and, and really that I'm, I'm a bit disturbed that isn't being taken forward here because you know it's a matter of real accountability rather than just being consulted or fake fake accountability which we see too much of in housing associations but anyway i i think they're really well made points and, and i couldn't agree more with you uh, Gaius, uh, the points exactly the same points that we've been making. Uh, we've seen a serious decline in independent tenant organisations, particularly since 2010, 11, 12. Um, the, the, there's been a kind of a, a corresponding increase in tenant scrutiny bodies and, and, and landlord uh, selected bodies doing a particular purpose, which they can set up and close down. And I think that the, the and, and we, we've continually highlighted the need that there needs to be recognition, even in our latest um, response to the direction uh, that was issued by government, which closed at the end of March. Uh, again, on the on the the direction to the regulator on the new tenant involvement and mutual exchange uh, um, uh, standards, um, where we think that it should be a, an obligatory right for independent tenant organisations to have their voices heard, uh, to have a right of audience with with uh, the landlord, and to and to make those. Um, and, and to be supported by the landlords as well, if they're if they if they're not, uh, so you make really good 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 points there. Uh, and then additionally on the the, the the issue about the there was a real watering down, wasn't there, from the green paper to the white paper? Yes, yes. Uh, and and I th again, I think we 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 were very very disappointed in some of those areas. And again, likewise on the on the na national tenant platform type um, issues that just wasn't just wasn't 
uh, contained and move forward into the white paper. Um, so I'm, I'm aware Deb has her hand up and then I think Carol and then we'll have to close uh, have to close. So so Deb first, then Carol and then we'll then we'll close. Um, I was just going to come in and, and agree that um, I think that's right. I think one of the, the biggest issues has been and I come at this as someone who was on a tenants association as quite a young person for a major council estate that had a decant and den demolition in London. Um, I also have been a housing association resident and, and now own so and I work for a housing association. So I come at this from all angles, having experienced it in a complete 360. Um, I think you're right that it takes time for a tenants association to get its voice and to get confident and to have the ability to be able to really get a handle on how to deal with other bodies, organisations around them. That's not a quick fix. And one of the things I would say is the lack of community centres and the lack of somewhere to actually be is a bigger problem because they've been given away. They've been mandated to other charities. They're often used for nurseries. If you've got nothing that brings people together, even in a friendly way, it's very difficult to then get bodies and voices cohesively like saying the same thing. I've been a trustee and I, one of the other things I can tell you is if there is manipulation about who you have on a group that you get the same voice because that voice you are quite right is actually trained to give the answers you want it's like a very very slick marketing campaign believe me you can get it to say whatever you want by asking the right questions so I think that's a real concern and when you are somebody who actually challenges you've got to have more than one lone voice and that that can take that can take an awful lot of gumption and somebody who's got an awful lot of front to actually make the big enough noise and I think with housing associations, I think one of the things we need to get out of is if you rent your property, I don't care what the tenure is, you are entitled to have a happy, healthy home. But on the, on the flip side, you should also look after it. You should also be considerate of your neighbours. Let's share space nicely. And I think when we get away from what the tenure is, I think we should get forward with the expectations of what we should expect what should be realistic expectations and actually what we should give back as, as part of the community. And I think sometimes we forget there's more than one side and having dealt with those that have squared quite openly to us as housing association officers, it's not mine, I don't care. I go, but it's your home. Why would you not care that your home was Thanks. good? So I think I leave it on that point really. Thank you, Debbie. Well said. Yeah, yeah, big round of applause as usual. I think Debbie as well. Um, uh, Carol, uh, over to you, and then we then we'll, we'll have to we'll have to wrap up. Yeah, I just wanted to say I'm, I've been in the old sector. Well, when I say old sector, the old homes. I was in there for like 16, 20 years. Then they started the new build homes, did social housing. Uh, what worries me is is the building new build homes for disabled people. They've got no tenancy workers in there who uh, uh, who know what they're doing for disabled people. They're putting, as you see behind me, appliances, lifts in the home. They've got no workers to sign them off, make sure they're safe for tenants, which is causing more disabilities. The, the things they're putting in the house aren't safe, to be fair, in the new builds. The new build homes are not going to last as long as the old build homes at this rate. It's, I've been to MPs, I've been to councils, the ombudsman, I've been everywhere. New build homes are built on what I would say areas that can't be um, changed. So... An example, I'm a disabled person. I was putting what social housing says, their new disabled home. I needed some disabled changes that can't be done due to restrictions of the area. Now, I'm to blame for that, apparently, because I shouldn't have took a disabled property. Now, when I took this property, it was classed as disabled, should be able to be adapted, even if it wasn't adapted. I've been told, well, it's social housing. Well, I'm sorry, social housing tenants still need help. Mm -hmm. The council are there to help, yeah, but to do help, yeah, because it becomes a stalemate between the council, the, the, the area people, and your housing associations, and they all blame each other, and we as tenants are just left to suffer. 
Look, yeah, I think I think I think Carol, that's the, the again, I think there's such well-made points about the real life consequences of what we were talking about is really what we're seeing again are the symptoms of the system because yes. because what you what you've got if you if you're if you're kind of following a process of let's maximize the units within a commercialized sector which is based upon well how much how much can we leverage to borrow to play the numbers game to build out what's the maximum a number of properties we can make then you see the reduction in the quality of, of, yes. of homes you've got reduction in the size um i know um my my chair will 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 highlight the importance of how we previously had parker morris standards for for buildings and the size which are non-existent within the existing build standards for, for and then on top of all of that you've then got the the needs of particular individuals to, to be met and uh, which costs more to, to, to adapt properties in a particular way. And that's not, but so, so, so there's a real lack of, of adapted properties. Don't take on disability homes, classing yourself as, now if I moved into a normal social housing home, I would do it all with as tenants. But if you move into what they call their new disability homes, they should be safe, they should be correct. You should have the people in place to help. I've been through so much in this home. I've gone through the process of the housing ombudsman, going to the housing association, everything's just turned out of context and there's been no help around. And that's the problem. We all need somebody to turn to when things go wrong and there's not that there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I can see that there's been some comments from uh, uh, from from Deb and Gaius about the, about, uh, I said, it, you can't, part of this kind of customer ethos approach and the changing terminologies that we use, it's kind of symptomatic again of those broader issues about, about units and the, um, movement away from it being a movement and it being just a kind of uh, a customer uh, transactional process. So yeah. we want a lookable home, not a lockable home. That's how I see it. For the new builds, they need to be livable, not just lockable. And they're not. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, complete. I think that's a good point for us to finish now, Carol. So thanks for yeah. your contributions and thanks for the contributions of everybody else. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. And, and uh, good to see you all. Thanks for joining. I hope you found it helpful and informative. Um, we'll uh, distribute a copy of the presentation. We'll post a copy of this recording on our YouTube and the details will all go out in the post event information. So um, thank you very much. And um, I look forward to seeing you um, at our next event, next event, next Thursday um, at the launch of um, launch event for, for our uh, latest publication. So uh, see you then. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.